Welcome to season three of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, Lindsay Smith-Rogers speaks with Tara Lloyd, Executive Director of Pivot, a nonprofit organization in Africa that partners with communities to provide health care. In early 2020, Pivot let the majority of U.S. employees go and shifted operations to Madagascar and other communities that Pivot serves. They talk about how they manage this transition and what the change means not only for the organization, but for global health care. Let's listen. Tara Lloyd, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Um, So first off, you were the first employee of the NGO Pivot seven years ago, and now you've served as the executive director for two years. Can you tell us a little bit about Pivot, what the organization does and its mission? Sure. Pivot is a health system strengthening NGO. We work at the invitation of the government of Madagascar to strengthen the public health system in and around the Ranamafana National Park, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site rainforest. And we're deep believers in the um, connection between people and planet in terms of our future. And so we're, we're working to save lives around the, the park and to build systems for the country of Madagascar um, to really have universal health coverage reach the farthest and most remote and rural corners of the country. So our district serves as a model of UHC coverage implementation that the government is intending to use to to bring that model to scale. And then tell us a little bit about uh, the operations of the organization. Let's go back actually to early 2020. Um, Tell us about how this team is staffed. Sure. So we have about 200 people on the ground in the Fanadine district. Um, that's not uncommon for an NGO like this. About 100 of those folks are um, lay staff. They're drivers and cooks and cleaners, and they're from the local community. And about 100 are professional staff, the nurses, doctors, social workers, finance folks. And many of those people come from the cities um, in Madagascar, and they move to this very rural area to take this position. And it's seen as something as a sacrifice, of course, um, the education for their kids and the distance from their families and such. So um, we have this large professional staff, and then a couple of those people are expatriates. At the beginning of 2020, there were uh, just three. And um, it it bothered me to some degree that those three people all held the the highest positions of leadership. And I've been thinking a lot about Malagasy leadership as being a really important um, step forward for Pivot. And then in the United States, I had at that point an eight-person administrative team, including myself. And we were set to add a ninth person to that team in January of 2020. And I was just starting to feel increasingly uncomfortable about the deference paid to that team of people, some of whom are quite junior, you know, doing pretty basic NGO type functions because we're a 501c3 incorporated in the U.S. But when they would visit Madagascar, they were referred to as as direct, well, some of them were directors, but anyone was kind of just th- this deference that was paid felt like but when the white Americans come, they, they're to be listened to and and you know, deferred to. And I, I just was feeling really uncomfortable. We're trying to build an organization um, based on humility and solidarity and being partners to the government. And I didn't want the jobs in the U.S. to be seen in that way. And you had also said that people even referred to the U.S. office as headquarters. That's true. It, it first was referred to as Boston because we were based out of um, the Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Harvard Medical School. Um, and it was a funny title because a couple of us weren't from there. didn't really feel like <laughs> Boston was a great name for us. And then I started allowing people to work in a dispersed manner and to move across the country, thinking that as long as people um, stay relevant to the time zone in Madagascar and visit frequently and stay a long time when they go, I don't really care where they live. And wouldn't that be liberating to do your job from rural Maine or in my case, um, from Kentucky, where my family is. And so then Boston was a really funny name. So we started being called, (laughs) well, all kinds of things. I'm, I'm laughing because I made a 
funny mistake in calling us the IST, the International Support Team, which I guess is the um, name for an STD in French, which, whoops, we didn't want to be that. Um, so then we started being called the US team at eventually um, headquarters. And I can't remember who said it first. I think it was someone in Madagascar, but I just let it happen. I didn't like it and I thought it seemed funny, but I didn't stop it. And so, yes, by January 2020, um, we were a team of nearly nine people in a headquarters office that actually wasn't a single office. And we had an executive leadership team that was um, populated by folks in Madagascar and in the U.S. And there was just too much decision making happening here. Yeah. And so recently you wrote an article about how you had kind of come to this pivotal point um, at the beginning of 2020, where you were feeling the tension of, of this sort of displacement between your U.S. team and your work abroad. Can you talk a little bit about where that led you to, what decisions it led you to make? Yes. A couple of months before that, I had been introduced to the concept of decolonizing global health, of thinking about patterns of power and dominance that have repeated themselves in the field, whether or not people intended for that to be the case. And it was becoming something I increasingly felt unsettled about in my own building of the team, recognizing myself as someone with that sort of white privilege and distance from the problems. And was it really mine to create this sort of team to address the solutions? And we went into the um, annual board meeting in January of last year over budget by $400,000. We were supposed to approve a budget and largely our budget had been driven up by the fact that we had this incredible opportunity to serve as a model district for universal health coverage, as I explained in the beginning of the podcast. And in order to do that and to really serve the 200,000 people in Ifan Adin with free and, and dignified care, it was going to cost Pivot a great deal more money as partner to the government. And I just couldn't find a way to get our budget in a manageable place and carry the HR costs that we were carrying in Madagascar and the U.S., both. And there's inequity in pay, which of course I'm sure your listeners realize. And I, I just, in the end, felt like I just shouldn't be building the team in this direction. I have to take a full stop and correct for my mistakes and reduce the team down um, to now what we are, three staff, and really move um, the center of gravity to Madagascar. And by that, the resources from those salaries, but the authority and the responsibility as well, and have the people in the U.S. be of service to that executive leadership team there. And this was just prior to COVID. I mean, how did you communicate this with your team on the ground in the U.S.? Well, that part was kind of awful. Um, I'm not sure had I seen that coming, I would have been able to stick to my guns. But um, the board meeting was in January. I got buy-in from the full board by February. And then the timing with COVID was just really kind of serendipitous. I flew to Boston from Kentucky to deliver the team in person to my staff um, on February the 12th. And from there, I flew on to Madagascar. When I came back at the end of the month, COVID had taken over the world, but the news had been given. And what I did with the staff um, was give each person the opportunity to design their own transition out. So to stay a minimum of two weeks and a maximum of three months to visit Madagascar again, if they wished to say goodbye to their friends and colleagues. I mean, these are people who had helped build the organization and who had given of themselves deeply and whose identity was tied up in the work as is true often, you know, in an organization like ours. And so I didn't, I couldn't just have it be this kind of mechanical decision. I, I really needed to be with each person and their journey. And it kind of surprised me who, who left quickly and who stayed longest and how much people wanted to put into their transition or not. Um, it was an interesting journey, but as COVID hit, we really didn't make any different accommodations. I mean, in fact, it was a relief not to have hundreds of thousands of dollars tied up in U.S. salaries when people would have had so little to do now that we couldn't travel or throw events or, you know, engage in the kind of support we had been providing. So, I mean, selfishly, I suppose my job was a little bit easier because of it, but emotionally, not at all. And so you are remaining in the U.S. for the time being. Can you talk a little bit about how that works? I'm glad you asked that because that's probably the glaring question in everyone's mind. Not just do I live in the U.S., but I retain this title of executive director. Um, and I, that is not my long-term goal for the organization. I, I want that executive directorship to be in Madagascar. And I think as long as we are raising funds in the U.S. and providing technical assistance from the institutions I mentioned. It's fine to have a very small team of people here, but they can't be in the hierarchy and they need to be in service to the long-term mission. And we need a board of directors that has a lot more Malagasy representation and, and operates primarily out of Madagascar. So 
um, I, I see my position as just um, continuing in the transition, that it was a lot for the organization to undergo this transition and that removing myself when I um, met with Malagasy advisors on our board about it, I was just told it, it would be too much and too soon and it would not be in service to the executive leadership team to be all of a sudden saddled with managing, you know, what you're coordinating for the organization right now from the U.S. And so we're on a journey and certainly my position is part of that. One thing I'd like to say is that I do spend the summers in Madagascar with my children. It's been kind of a school years in the U.S. and summers in Ranamafana life. It's been beautiful and it will be a hard thing for me to let go of. I, I'm not looking forward to that, but I do think that eventually it's the right thing for the organization and perhaps there'll be something that I can still do from here, but I don't think it will be called executive director. I want to talk about this in the broader context of NGOs and how other global health organizations are grappling with this. Is this a topic that you see in a lot of places? Are there other organizations you think that are going to follow suit? Well, certainly I think it's something that lots of people are grappling with and that the year of 2020 only made that more clear in many ways. I've had the privilege of talking to a lot of the leaders of the peer organizations of Pivot. So Pivot was born of Partners in Health and we're noted as a mission partner by them. And then we're part of something called the Community Health Impact Coalition, which is many organizations like Pivot working in a specific country as a partner to the government, promoting universal health coverage, working with community health workers and such. So um, lots of the leadership looks a lot like me, you know, somebody with a deep commitment to to these issues um, who's seen the inequity and wants to do something about it, but is American and is living in America. And so, um, yes, people are grappling with it. There have been some creative solutions from peers that I've seen, um, co-directorships. I've seen um, organizations uh, split and have a U.S. uh, kind of a friends of the organization that is based in the the country. And some of those transitions have gone really well. And some of them have some kind of warning lessons that my peers are reaching out and saying, you know, be careful that you don't move too quickly, that you don't base your decisions on particular personalities and connections that current staff might have to current board, because those are about people and you need this to be about the structure that's going to withstand. And and that there, there does need to still be some role for the international community. And it's about figuring out how to do that with deference and humility. So I have had some really nice conversations and um, there've been some decolonization webinars and Duke led a really nice seminar last year that I attended. Dr. Pai, a professor at McGill uh, University is somebody who's really led the way with a lot of the language and, and toolkits and things. So yes, there are resources out there and there are other people trying. Do you have any quick recommendations for organizations that might be thinking about something like this? Uh, Well, I mean, my my recommendation is to do it. I I feel strong about the position that I'm standing in now, having made the decision and rested in the discomfort and and gone ahead and done this. And I think you can do it with dignity and you can thank the people who have helped you build the organization and and tell them that their, their job is done. And that's a good thing. Um, And I think, you know, as long as you can do it compassionately and you're able to empower the team that is taking on those responsibilities and authority that were once held elsewhere, that I would highly recommend it as something that once you feel clearly in your gut, you act on. Well, thank you so much, Tara Lloyd, for your time. We so appreciate how you have brought some clarity to acknowledging both your power and privilege and how people and organizations can wrestle with this imbalance. Thanks, Lindsay. That's what this chapter of history is all about, I think. (laughs) Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, C.N. Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo and Neiman Outland. Social media support from Brenda Hagader, Grace Holes-Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening.